One byproduct of gardening is you start to imagine how different the world would be if more people made certain lifestyle choices. And one of those for me is I think everyone should own worms. I know how kooky that sounds, so these first few minutes are just gonna be me trying to convince you that worms are the most underrated pet available. They don't smell, the only thing they eat is your trash, and their waste in actuality is more of a high value asset than waste at all. In the same way that shrimps get so-called veins, worms get a friendlier name for their dookies, castings. Worm castings are such a highly prized organic fertilizer that a sack of the stuff can cost as much as flank steak if you buy it online. Here in Phoenix, there's a full-scale worm farm that makes big business out of turning food waste into castings. So even if you don't garden at home, you can still go Vaynerchuk mode and secure a bag flipping worm turds you made out of coffee grounds at home. By the way, homemade worm castings are even more valuable than store-bought because they'll have live worm eggs in them. Let's say you don't even care about the worm castings. Still, the most transformative part about having worms at home is their composting power. There must be some kind of secret gardener's pact that requires everyone to pretend that composting is easy, but it's not. I've got two big composters out back full of food scraps and hay that refuses to break down even years later because I never successfully attained that productive ratio of browns to greens. The only thing I did get was rats. Compare that to my sweet, beautiful bucket of worms into which I dump almost all of my kitchen scraps and watch them disappear within a week. The only things I don't add are meats, citrus, spicy stuff, and onions. But everything else, dead flowers, spent tea bags, banana peels, it all goes to the worms. I already know I'm gonna be fighting for my life in these comments trying to shoot down any anti-worm rhetoric because Brie even mentioned my tenacious pro-worm debates in her wedding vows. So I'll assume everyone still watching is fully convinced and ready to get started. You'll need three things to get started. Worms, worm housing, and worm bedding. The king of composting worms is the red wiggler, and you could easily buy a cup of them from a pet store today. While I'm sure they'd be grateful to be given a home instead of being used as bait or live feed, that volume is just too small to get started, even for a tiny worm farm. I had a much better experience buying a big sack from Uncle Jim's worm farm online. Again, buy the red wigglers. They're composting machines and they're less likely to become an invasive pest in your hometown. As for worm housing, there are a ton of options. The most popular indoor option is to use a series of plastic totes that stack on top of each other. This costs very little, and I'll link you to some instructional videos of other people making theirs. But personally, I didn't like the fact that the bin systems require you to rotate the bins every couple of months. I wanted a totally hands-off solution. You could also just buy pre made versions that look more attractive so you can store them in a closet or a pantry. The worms aren't going to get out and they're not going to smell, so this is a fine choice for apartment dwellers. But I wanted mine outside, partly because I wanted to raise a ton of them and partly because I know that my curious dogs would surely find a way to free all the worms into my home. The outdoor store-bought solution then would be to just buy a sub pod. These are cleverly designed and all you have to do is bury one in the ground or in a raised bed. If you've got the money, this is probably the easiest option of them all. There's no tote rotating or DIYing. The worms come into the pod to eat and then go out to fertilize the rest of the soil. I ended up just making my own sub pod because all it required was a bunch of stuff I already had. So that's what I will be demonstrating today. Take a standard two or five gallon bucket and drill holes all around its lower third. This is so easy that I can do it with this rusty half inch bit and entry level drill. The holes just need to be big enough to let fully grown worms in and out. So you could make big one or two inch holes if you've got the tools, but don't go too small. A half inch is plenty. Bury this in a garden bed all the way up to the lip. You could just bury it underground if you have a backyard, but I live in Arizona where the rock hard clay soil isn't friable enough to allow for worm movement. So I just put them in raised beds. To this empty buried bucket, add the final ingredient, a couple inches of wet worm friendly bedding. I would use finely shredded paper, shredded leaves, or wet coconut coir. Potting soil would work too, you just need something that's loose enough to allow for wriggling and absorbent enough to hold water. Add your worms to this bedding so that they can get comfortable. Worms hate the sunlight, so they will immediately wiggle down towards the bottom. I like to add a paper grocery bag or newspaper on top to make some shade. Even though you will be putting a plastic lid on this, the plastic is still a little bit translucent, so this extra layer of shade will help them get more comfortable coming to the surface for food. Dampen the contents of the bucket, put a lid on top to keep the pests out, water your whole garden bed, and that's it. The process of feeding your worms 
is easy. Open the bucket, take out that shade paper, drop some food in it, and drop the shade and lid back in place. That's it for now. Over the next couple of weeks, the worms will fatten up and start becoming active, but until then, they're barely gonna have the wherewithal to break down a small amount of food. Add like one apple core and don't add any more until you see that it's completely been eaten. Once your worms are in full swing, they will eat half their body weight in food every day and double in population every month. They can live several weeks without being fed, so don't worry about always having food in the bucket. In fact, it's better to underfeed them than it is to overfeed them because if you put too much food in the bucket, it'll start getting stinky and moldy before they're able to break it down. This is their home now, a lid to keep pests out, a thick paper shade to keep sunlight out, and a buffet of food scraps on top of some warm, wet bedding. They can come up to the surface to eat and then wriggle down into the bucket and all over the garden bed to seek out water and fertilize your garden right at the roots. At this point, the only thing that could go wrong is if it got way too dry in your garden bed. Worms really can't drown, so overwatering isn't a problem. And if it's too hot at the edges of the bed, they can just venture deeper into the soil where the temps are more regulated. I guess they could freeze to death, but that's not really a problem here in Arizona. And since my garden beds are giant four foot by four foot sub-irrigated planters, the soil's always gonna be perfectly moist. The only long-term task I might need to perform is taking the whole bucket out every once in a while to distribute those worm castings in a different garden bed to make more room for bedding and food, but that's gonna take a long while. The low maintenance, the perfect symbiosis, the absence of barking and shedding, everyone says that dogs should be my best friend, but when I die, it's the worms who will take care of my final chore, turning this meat sack into dirt for Mother Gaia. Darla, start pulling your weight around here. 